Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Field Museum's uh, Wednesday noon seminar, our armor seminar. Uh, before we start with an introduction to John Bates, I want to give an, a land acknowledgement. The Field Museum acknowledges that it resides within the traditional homelands of the Three Fires Confederacy, the Ojibwe, the Odawa, and the Potawatomi. The museum recognizes and is grateful for the original peoples who laid the foundation for the city of Chicago and for the diverse indigenous nations that reside in Chicago today. So welcome everyone. There's uh, this, uh, before I get a little bit serious, this is me while John was in Antarctica. Um, I hate winter in every way, shape or form. So this was my winter experience while John was having the life, uh, the experience of a lifetime in Antarctica. So, hey, John, get me off the screen, please. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> just to contextualize our life, um, there's a lot about John that you can look up online. You can see where he graduated. Um, you'd see where he went to school, that he was from Arizona, uh, that except for a short stint in Washington State as his first year as an undergraduate, for which he rapidly left to go back to Arizona because it was too rainy in Wisconsin, he spent most of his growing up years in Arizona. But his family instilled in him a love of travel uh, that I think extends as a theme throughout his life. So he grew up in a family that traveled all over the place and that really valued travel, valued um, an understanding of culture an understanding of history. And of course, we can't ignore birds as the foundation of so much of his travel. And this love of travel and experiencing birds across the globe, I think is one of the driving forces behind John, his both his life and his career. Uh, in fact, John went on an expedition before he actually started work for real in the Field Museum. We moved here and two days later, he went on an expedition. Um, our son was born a little more than a year after we came to Chicago and 10 days later, he went on a field expedition. And since then, John has traveled with his students, with staff all over the world with a goal of creating scientists, improving collections, and teaching people how to inventory biodiversity all over the world. It's a deep commitment that he has, and it reflects in all that he does. So he's actually the best person I know and the best partner. So I'm really grateful, especially in the last two years, to have been stuck inside with John, except that he can never go away again in the winter because I'm never doing winter chores ever again. So what I would say about this trip is that it would be the trip of a lifetime, except John's had a lot of trips of lifetimes. It's one of the real benefits of his career. So I'm happy he's getting to share this trip with us. Um, and I'll stop before I get even more sentimental. So take it away, John. Thank you. It's great to be here and thanks all for coming. I'm gonna, as Shannon said, take you on a, it really was a trip of a lifetime. Um, and the talk is basically a travel log. There's gonna be a little bit of science in it, but I wanna just take you to these places. We're gonna start out by going to the Antarctic Peninsula. Then we're gonna to go to South Georgia, which is in the middle there. And then we're gonna finish back up in the Falklands where we will we'll actually start the trip. And this is a trip about penguins. And uh, I guess I'll just start by giving it away, which is that as cool as I thought penguins were before this trip, they're way cooler than I ever realized. So with that, I also want to acknowledge why this trip happened, which is that it was the vision of, uh, of basically five women who led this trip. Uh, one of them was Jane Younger, who a, was a postdoc at Loyola University, spent a lot of time in the Pritzker labs. She was the one who originally came to us with the idea of going to the uh, Robert A. Pritzker Meteoritics and Polar Studies uh, program to, to put in a grant to, to um, allow us um, to charter this boat that we that we took, and you'll see about this. So there's also Rachel Herman, the next person there. She's a graduate student finishing up her PhD at uh, Stony Brook, working on Gen 2 penguins on the Antarctic Peninsula. Sushma Reddy is a curator of birds at the Bell Museum and a former 
longtime collaborator of ours here in, in uh, at Loyola when she was here. Gemma Klukas is a postdoc at the uh, Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And then finally, in, in front there is Katie O'Brien, who's a beginning graduate student at the University of Bath, which is where Jane was before she took a job recently in Tasmania. So we had a bunch of expertise on penguins. They came to us in 2019 and they said, we'd like to write a proposal to, to go to Antarctica by boat and sample penguins. And I was like, okay, as long as I get to come along. And that was scheduled for 2021, didn't happen. January, 2021, January 22 rolls around and suddenly it looks like everything's falling into place. And I can still remember when this picture was taken, we uh, left on December 26th and Jacob Cooper, who's my former graduate student there in the middle, had to come in from Kansas and we had to go around trying to find on Sunday, December 26th, a place that would give him a PCR test before we could get on the planes. And so this was touch and go the whole way, but it worked out. We got down to the Falkland Islands with the nine uh, passengers where we met up with three crew and we boarded this boat. This boat is a specially designed boat for Antarctic research called the Vincent of Antarctica. This was the first trip that it had actually made in Antarctica. It was built in, uh, in Europe and had sailed in the Arctic. It's the brainchild of a guy who runs pelagic expeditions named Skip Novak, who's from Chicago and is an absolutely legendary uh, sailor. And it, it's a 77 foot sailboat. I know nothing about sailing. I still don't know as much as I'd like to after this trip, but it was, it's just an amazing uh, uh, craft. Now I wanna start in Stanley Har Harbor where we got on the boat and we had a meal of squid. And right away you start realizing that the three crew you're worth with are really special. One, they're very experienced in the, in the Antarctic, but two, they can all cook. And one of them, the first mate, uh, Kenneth P uh, Pendragon had uh, written a cookbook. And then I'm gonna come back to this later in the talk, but this is the kind of things you see in Stanley Harbor. Here's a guy leaving in a sailboat with a rack of lamb on the back of his boat. And I'll come back to that later in the talk. So this is a map from Google Earth with eBird, with little dots indicating all the eBird lists we put on the trip. If you look at the left-hand side here, or up by the South American, uh, tip of South America, you can see we started in the Falkland Islands. We sailed down to the Antarctic Peninsula, worked around the Antarctic Peninsula, came back to South Georgia, and then back to the Falklands. And because almost everybody knows something about Shackleton, I just wanted to put this up there. The endurance was found in 10,000 feet of water on the east side of the Antarctic Peninsula. And uh, we were on the west side. And the one other thing I'd say is they spent a lot more than we did. And the one thing I'd also say, and this is for uh, Janet Voigt to some extent, the thing I thought was most interesting about finding the endurance was actually all the benthic animals that were on there. So once you get out in the open ocean, one of the first things you see are members of the Procellariformes, which are really prominent down here. So this is a giant petrel, and this is one phase of, of what, they're, uh, what they can look like. This is a giant petrel too. And so where I wanna go on this is, I'm gonna talk about a bunch of things over the course of this talk. You could go into detail on any one of these species and their biology, but, but giant petrels will actually come up again in this talk. There are other types of seabirds. And again, you're going across, it takes five days to get down to the Antarctic Peninsula. And here's a soft plumage petrel. Here's an Antarctic prion. Several million of these are thought to breed on South Georgia. We'll, we're, we're, we'll go later in the trip. And then of course on the South Seas, the kind of magical set of birds are albatrosses. And there are multiple species. This is a black browed albatross. This is a gray-headed albatross. These guys are in the same genus, Thalassarchy. Then this is a member of the genus Phobetria called uh, light-mantled albatross. And uh, they again breed on South Georgia. And these, these are birds that are traveling for thousands of miles from their uh, nesting sites to reach their feeding areas. And remember, this is the, the Antarctic summer. So we're doing this at the height of the summer. And so, the real bird that you wanna see, and I had never seen an albatross before this trip is wandering albatross. Now, interesting thing about taxonomy is wandering albatross is now recognized as upwards of seven species because every single breeding island that's been looked at or breeding area that's been looked at has genetically distinct populations and they're starting to find morphological differences between them too. And these are these birds, this is a 
12 foot wingspan. They can fly for hours at a time. They can sleep at night, turning off parts of their brain and on fly on the wing. So they're, they're just amazing birds. And to see them fly you know, across the bow of the boat during the course of the day is just unimaginable. After five days, you've crossed the Scotia Sea and you get into what's called the Strait of Gurlash. And now you've got a completely different ocean because it's buffeted by the islands on the outside. And so it's just crystal clear. And you're looking around at a landscape that's just unimaginably at some level desolate and beautiful at the same time, full of ice and snow and rock. And here's Sushma Reddy taking a, a photograph. Again, just an incredible place. You're starting to see things like humpbacked whales. There's ice in the water. This is uh, Bryce jo uh, Robinson from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, one of the other people on the ship. And then the immensity of it comes into play when you see something like this. So in the distance, there is a four story tall uh, tour boat. And that shows you the size of these glaciers that are just coming right down to the edge of the water all around you. And a lot of times it's very quiet. And then you're reminded by what's going on. The temperatures are warming. And so this is a picture of a bunch of snow falling off the top of uh, one of the cliff faces along the way. And then depending on what's going on with glacial melt and, and uh, sunlight hitting the water, you can just see incredibly fascinating variation in the water. But what we're going for is penguins. And as you head south, you start seeing a few, then you start seeing a few more. And then finally, you get to a site like this where you're looking in the distance and you're looking at a penguin colony. And this is the kind of landscape they're around. And as you get closer, you can start seeing that these Jintu penguins are nesting on tops of these hills and they're making their way up and down to get back to their nesting sites day in, day out. And it's just a spectacular site. And so here's the, the key player here in this sense. This is uh, an Antarctic Jintu penguin. Um, and we got down here and again, I seen penguins a few times before in, in, in continental situations, but, but to see them in, in a place like this in Antarctica was just amazing. And one of the reasons why we wanted to do this trip was some work that was ongoing and was published actually in, in 2020 as we were getting ready for this trip by some of the colleagues, some of the women that I mentioned, Gemma Klukas, Jane Younger, and uh, uh, Sushma Reddy. And they did genetic work on these Jintu penguins, which occur all across the South Polar region. So they're on, their populations on the Falklands, on South Georgia, and on the Antarctic Peninsula, in addition to, to Kerguelen Island, which you can see is way far to the, um, to the west here in this, in this particular uh, image. And what they've shown is that these are morphologically and genetically distinct units, such that they recommended that there be four species of Jintu penguin. This is still a little bit controversial, but one of the things we were doing was getting data from additional uh, penguin colonies and additional samples to look more into this in a lot of different ways. And again, these penguins are so freaking cool that, that you just can't imagine when you get to them. So what happens is you pull up to an area, everybody gets ready, you bring all your supplies, you jump in a Zodiac and you land on this area filled with penguin excrement and you work your way up to the colony to start working on penguins. And it's just absolutely absurd how fascinating it is and how interesting the penguins are in you at some level. This is Irby Lovett, one of the, uh, he's a professor at the, in the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And again, this is one of these Jintu penguins looking at him. It's not just penguins, there are mammals around. This is a Weddell seal that was near one of the first penguin colonies we uh, went to. This is the only time this animal lifted its head in about five hours, and it was up for about 30 seconds. As I said, we, you know, we were collecting multiple samples. Um, this is penguin poop, and it's orange, and it's mostly krill. And krill is this completely fascinating base of the ecological system in, the, in this part of the world. And it's something that we really need to understand in terms of what this ecosystem is dealing with in terms of things like climate change. And so, as I said, Katie O'Brien's dissertation is going to be looking at krill from these populations of Jintu penguins across this entire South Polar uh, transect that we looked at. 
Here's a nesting site out in the uh, islands off the coast of uh, the Antarctic Peninsula. And you can see it's very rocky. One of the things you, I won't necessarily remember to say about it, this is look at where these uh, nesting sites are for these Jintu penguins over the course of this talk because they vary quite a bit across geography. There are other species of penguins here that we were also sampling such as chinstrap, which is a penguin that, that lives in not the, the most, the, not the coldest parts of the Antarctic, but is most common along the, the places like the Antarctic Peninsula and some of the coastal areas. And they're really spectacular birds. And as you can see, all these birds were in the midst of their breeding uh, cycles. And over the course of the talk, you'll see as time goes on, the chicks are gonna get bigger and bigger. So this was the only place on the entire trip where we encountered Adelie penguins. So Adelie penguins and emperor penguins are the two species that are most adapted to high Antarctic conditions. And there are scattered colonies of uh, Adelies in a few places around the Antarctic Peninsula. And so we were really happy to run into them here and, and get a chance to see what they're like because they're just bizarre looking birds. I mean, I just, again, I have no idea what the, the adaptive significance of that head structure is, but it's, it, I'd love to know more. There are other birds besides penguins here, and some of them can be really fun. This is a, an Antarctic shag colony with a couple of birds, and shags are just, it's a British name for, for cormorant. So these are just, these are in the same genus as our double-crested cormorants here, but they're actually really beautiful. And then I've got some videos here that I'm gonna show you just to give you an idea of what it's like to, why is that not coming up? That's interesting. Oh, there we go. To remind you that, that penguins are aquatic birds. And, you know, this is an easy thing to forget, but every once in a while you'll just see them in these situations and you realize what they're really adapted for is water, not land. And it's just mind boggling to watch them uh, just sort of move around here. And this is a colony or a group of birds at one of the colonies in shallow water, uh, chinstrap penguins just going through the motions of uh, catching krill and. And so the other thing you'll see is they're often in groups like this, and there's good reason for that. This is a leopard seal. And this is basically, other than killer whale, essentially the only uh, carnivorous uh, species that are affecting the penguin colonies, but they're always around. Every good sized penguin colony will have a leopard seal around it. And so these birds come in and out as in groups trying to avoid being the one the leopard seal actually catches. Because there's actually, this is a situation where there's life and death going on all the time at these colonies. There are a bunch of birds that have evolved to be scavengers. This is a, a South Polar skua. Um, this is a snowy sheath bill. Both these birds, I was looking at this, the lineages of these birds are upwards of 32 to 40 million years old. And penguins have been around for upwards of 50 to 60 million years. So you're looking at this scavenging and I think it's possible that these interactions with these guys scavenging around these penguin colonies has actually been going along for an awful long period of time. And you can see they're, they're just kind of omnipresent, which is actually a really good thing if you want to uh, salvage uh, eggshells. And over the course of the trip, I realized that we had the possibility and we had the permissions to pick up eggshells. And I think we can do a lot of neat research looking at the evolution of eggshell shape and probably eggshell composition across this same gradient that they've been studying genetically. We also did things like the cord birds. Here's Jacob uh, out in about 20 degree weather. The temperatures this time of year on the Antarctic Peninsula range from about 20 up to about 35 or so. Um, and you've got 24 hours of daylight for the most part. We were also doing things like changing batteries and uh, cameras that are uh, permanent camera setups that are um, at the colonies. And, and this was a big thing because with COVID, a lot of these investigators haven't been able to get down to some of these sites. And these, these cameras are providing really neat information to, about what's going on across the annual cycle of these Gentoo penguins. So a paper that came out right after we got back 
is this one about black carbon footprint on and human presence on Antarctica. And what they basically did was look at an area where there haven't been much boat traffic and compared it to samples that they got from uh, snowfields in areas where there is a lot of human traffic. And they're able to show that black carbon is much more present in the areas where tourists are, are going into the Antarctic Peninsula and researchers too. And they estimated that, that it may be taking about an inch or so off the level of snow cover each year. So, you know, these are the kinds of things that you want to take into account. Now, one of the things I told you at the beginning was that Rachel Herman is studying expansion of Jintu penguins up the Antarctic Peninsula. And when I say up the Antarctic Peninsula, what I mean is they're starting in the north and going south. And it's quite possible that one of the things they're benefiting from is changes in snow cover because they need open areas in order to have their nesting sites on the peninsula. So just to leave Antarctica, I mean, I just want to point out that the, it's just a breathtaking place in terms of the scenery. So once we got done with that, we got out into the open ocean. And again, I want to come back to the fact that here we are four or five miles from any island and there's a group of chinstrap penguins going out to feed. And it's easy to forget that these are entirely aquatically evolved birds. The ship crossings are, are uh, can be as bad as you might imagine them to be, but again, we ate very well on this trip. But I did want to show you this video just to give you an idea of what it's like. And this boat is, is absolutely perfectly designed. Everything is locked down. And uh, this is Kenneth uh, Pedragon uh, cleaning up after making lunch. And you can see in the back, there's a pressure cooker that's on an armature that's able to swing with the rolling of the boat so that nothing spills out. And a little while here, we're gonna pan across and you're gonna see Bryce uh, Robinson, who's an incredible artist, actually working on a table throughout all this. And so you really, you do get used to it. So there's Bryce working on a Jintu penguin uh, drawing that he did. And then I'm gonna go to the window and I just wanted to show you because those of you who have been around a long time will remember the Shackleton exhibit. And one of the things about the Shackleton exhibit was this gray ocean. And it was really something to get to sort of experience the variation that you see in the ocean. And what you'll see here is this is rocking is it's gonna suddenly turn green. And that's because water has gone over that window. And so this boat is rolling around quite a bit. And yet at the same time, you know, I'm sitting there trying to think about where we're, where we're getting to. And where we're getting to next is uh, South Georgia Island. And this is just an incredible place uh, out in the middle of the Southern Atlantic. And again, we've, we've come across this rough ocean. We've come around the corner of uh, the east side of South Georgia. And we're now in a quiet harbor called Cooper Bay. And this is the advantage we had doing the trip this way. Being able to charter this sailboat and having it under our complete control allowed it to, just to visit all these different sites and have as much time as we needed to do the work we did at each place. And so it's just a, an, an incredible opportunity to, to do field work. Now, the thing about South Georgia is that it's absolutely incredible in terms of its mountains. And I always like to point out to people that as amazing as it was that Shackleton was able to sail across the Scotia Sea, I actually think one of the most impressive things that Shackleton had to do was he landed, he and his group landed on the south side of South Georgia, and they had to cross these mountains with no mountaineering equipment to get to the whaling stations on the north side of the island. This is one of those whaling stations. It's the only habited place on all of South Georgia. It's called Grid Vicken. It's an old, as I said, an old whaling colony. And I wanna point out here that, that you know, this is a part of the world where humans did everything they could to kill as many animals as possible for a long period of time. The whaling and sealing industry was, was going full bore into the 1950s um, at, at some of these sites. And now there, there's a great museum and a, a post office and things and a little research station on Grid Vicken, which only had about 12 uh, people when we were there. You can see some of these uh, old whaling boats. This is where Shackleton's buried and that's Shackleton's uh, tombstone on the left. To be honest with you, I was more, I don't know, moved by seeing uh, a monument 
for a, the only slain Argentine uh, soldier during the Falklands War. And I was just thinking about how crazy war was, and I had no idea what would happen once we came back to the States in January. And so, again, it, it's it, the Falklands War is well presented in the museum, and it's just absurd to me that people would be fighting over things like that in this part of the world. And of course, humans do lots of other things too. So they bring foreign plants. That's a dandelion. I'm trying to collect as many dandelion photos from as many continents as I can over the course of my career. The other thing that was uh, released onto South Georgia were rats and, uh, and, uh, and mice. Now, the interesting thing here was that in 2000, people were concerned actually that these animals were leading to the um, loss of a lot of the endemic terrestrial birds. And they started a campaign to get rid of them. And I think because of the nature of the glaciated uh, highlands and the harsh climate, there was a fairly narrow band of areas and they were successful to where mice and rats are actually gone from the Falkland Islands. And these traps are here because they don't want any of the tour boats bringing them back. And as I said, seals, fur seals, whales, that's what were harvested here for, for over 70, 80 years. Once they stopped, these populations came back. And these fur seals are literally everywhere along the beaches. And this time of year, the, the males on the left have got their, their harems of females and the females all have young and they're just blazing around on the beach. And we actually had to, we were required to take sticks with us because as you're walking through these fur seal colonies, they're not necessarily happy about you being in the area. And so every once in a while, they'll come after you. And if you put the stick out, you can, you can keep them away. So here's uh, Rachel and uh, Irby cleaning off after a day, of, a day of work. Here's another video here, just to give you an idea of what these uh, uh, shorelines look like. Here's an emperor, I mean, a king penguin now that's come up on the beach of South Georgia. I'll talk more about king penguins in a little while. And you can just see there's just these amazing numbers of fur seal pups all over the beaches. And I also want you to notice how completely unperturbed these animals are by the fact that we're there. I don't think I've ever been in a place where the animals were less concerned about, about our presence. You know, he's just looking around. Here's our group. There's a skua, just because skuas are always around. And then I'll come back to this, but here are a bunch of molting king penguins. And I'll, I'll tell you more about that as we go along. Now there are different birds here. This is the southernmost passerine bird in the world. This is a, a South Georgia pipit. This was one of the birds that was in 2000 reported to be mostly confined to the islands offshore where there were no rats. Now that the rats have been removed, these birds were everywhere on the island. We had them all over the place. So they've responded really well. This is an endemic pintail and it's the same situation where most of the populations of this bird when the rats were present had moved offshore. And now as they've come back, what you can see is that they depend fairly heavily on the penguin colonies and they'll often hang around. So there's both a pipit and a, a pintail in this photo. And of course there are other mammals around. These are Southern elephant seals that are pulling up on the beach to molt. Um, the amazing thing to me about this was that these are all basically young uh, animals. They still look pretty impressive when they get mad at one another and start bellowing and, and showing their teeth and you can see all the scarring but most of the really large males are actually still out at sea and come in later to, to do their molting. All right, so this is that boat that we saw in Stanley Harbor at the beginning of this talk. And it's, uh, it was, it's run by a guy named uh, uh, Leif Ponset. He's one, from one of the, the primary conservation families in the Falkland Islands. And he sailed this boat by himself to South Georgia. And we met up with him here in one of the harbors and he came aboard for dinner. 
And when he came aboard for dinner, he said to us, you guys are ornithologists. He goes, I had this yellow bird when I was between the Falklands and South Georgia that landed on my boat. He goes, do you think you could tell me what it is? And we said, sure. And we were wondering. And the next morning, he came on the boat and showed me a, a picture, which I took a picture of his camera phone. And this is what he showed me. So for the ornithologists in the crowd, people will recognize this as a prothonotary warbler. And let me show you the distribution of prothonotary warbler relative to this particular record. So prothonotary warblers breed in the Eastern US, winter down into Northern South America, and Leaf had this bird land on his boat where that red arrow is. So the neat thing is, this is thanks to Jacob Cooper, this has been put into to, uh, uh, eBird and is essentially published as such. And so it's an incredible record. And again, it just shows you some of the amazing things. And I like to say that the, one of the most interesting birds on the trip was something that we didn't even see. I put this in for Matt Nelson. Uh, this is a lichen. Um, when you get to South Georgia, you start realizing there's an immense divergence of uh, diversity of uh, various plant life. And one of the things I found really interesting on this is listening to Todd Wilhelm give a talk a few years ago because he was suggesting that seabirds might be carrying around spores. And if you start, once you get down here and you start seeing where these seabirds are breeding, you start realizing that that's entirely possible and there needs to be a lot more research into this. So the other thing we were using is technology for the, for the, to help the penguin community understand population change. And this is Gemma Klukas who uh, before the trip trained at Cornell to get her uh, drone license. Um, this is a chin strap penguin. It's the only chin strap penguin colony that uh, is on this part of uh, South Georgia. And we would send it up and the, what's on the right there is actually a picture of the entire colony. And she's now working on, she did this at every site and we're working on getting artificial intelligence out there to be able to get better estimates of the number of pairs um, on these various sites. Here's what it looks like uh, on the islands as you're coming into land. There's all this tussock grass. You've got some elephant seals up on the beach. You've got fur seals all over the place. You've got a little group of king penguins. And then up at the top of that green hill, you can kind of see some little white smears. And that's a Jintu penguin colony. And Here's what it looks like from the colony itself where we went up to work on it and looking back into the bay. And the ship we're on, the Vincent of Antarctica is actually in the center of this, of the, this picture. Off to the left is a big cruise boat. It's one of the only cruise boats we saw. This year, about 50% of the companies didn't even run tours. Those that did actually had major troubles with COVID for the most part. And uh, this was a French ship that spent about four hours in the bay before it headed off to Antarctica. And so again, this highlights the value of the way we were able to do this, this trip. So now getting into the penguins on, on, on uh, this part of the world, this is a macaroni penguin. They breed in these colonies on, on steep slopes. This one was, we were at the water, the, the, we got in some rain and this was, it was wet and cold here and we decided it wasn't even safe to get up there. To the right of that colony is a, is a colony of gray-headed albatrosses. And you know, again, these are just spectacular birds that are going out long distances and coming back and raising uh, one or one or two young at a time, just like the penguins do. And these penguins, again, you can see the chicks are getting bigger. The macaronis are really great. Sometimes they get a little upset at one another and you can see these two uh, doing that. I don't think we're gonna be able to hear things because it's not working, but I wanna show you the, You know, these penguin displays are just really wonderful. And you watch these, and it's very clear that the pair bonds are really strong. So those are Jintu penguins on the left. In this case, they're, they're uh, South Georgia Jintus. And then I'm gonna switch over to the macaroni penguins. And you can see these different types of displays. And again, I, I point out how completely nonplussed these birds are by having a group of humans standing in their midst and doing stuff.
And it's fat, you know, these guys look like they don't have a clutch of eggs. And so my guess is they're increasing their pair bonds, but this time of year they should have chicks and maybe the, what happened is their, their eggs were infertile or something. So now let's look at king penguins. So king and emperor penguins are in many ways the iconic members of this group of birds. And again, it was kind of incredible to get the king penguins on South Georgia. So emperor penguins are on the Antarctic Peninsula. King penguins are, are much higher latitude or lower latitude in the sense that they're actually on places like South Georgia. Um, again, they're about three feet tall. Uh, and they have this amazing breeding system where it takes up to 14 months for uh, a young bird to, to reach maturity. And that means that you see these colonies where there are birds of all these different ages just sort of hanging out there, being fed by their parents for this period of time, um, you know, through the winter too. And so that's, you know, it's, again, it's just uh, some amazing adaptations. And this is, these juveniles look like they have these shaggy brown coats and that's almost certainly an adaptation for uh, maintaining their uh, temperatures during the winter. Like I said, these birds are interacting with these giant sea mammals, but uh, this is a young uh, Southern elephant seal and they just don't seem to matter. And then these colonies of king penguins can get to be huge and they're all along the beaches here in, in South Georgia. And this is one of them at St. Andrews Bay. And the estimates are that there are upwards of 50,000 pairs of birds here. And so, I mean, it's just a, I can't even describe what it's like to be standing on this hill looking out and being able to see thousands and thousands of penguins, king penguins in every direction. And a lot of them are these juveniles that are going through these molts. And I put this one in just because they all look unhappy at this part of their life. You know, they're just kind of halfway through doing it. And then, you know, you start to wonder how the heck do individuals find each other in these giant colonies? And I've looked a little bit into the literature on that, and I don't think there is much. Penguins have been really hard to, to find an effective way to mark individuals. And so as a result, I think there still needs to be a lot of work on this. But, you know, the idea of finding your mate or your chick in, in 200,000 birds is just kind of hard. But I want to emphasize again that South Georgia is an absolutely beautiful place to be uh, working and, and every once in a while stepping back and looking around at the kind of landscape that you're in as you're, you're getting blood and fecal samples from these penguins. And then of course, it's easy to forget that these penguins are dealing with real life. This is a bird that came up on the shore on South Georgia and you can see this horseshoe shaped marking on its breast, which is almost certainly the result of a leopard seal attack. And then to the right, you can see the head of a giant petrel. And this bird was, this penguin was literally being harried by this giant petrel um, as it came up on shore. And you wonder what the future of this is in terms of having this bird heal up. And as I said, these giant petrels are voracious uh, scavengers and, and predators. This is a very dead um, uh, sea lion. And these guys have no trouble digging into them. And that was good for us at some level, because what it meant was that if we found a dead penguin, it had basically been entirely gutted and cleaned up and there was a little skin left on it. So we brought back a number of, or we salvaged a number of skeletons that'll be coming back to the museum. And this is Sushman and I working on a, a bird that were, which actually had a, a salvageable skin of king penguins. So the last place I wanna to come to is the Falkland Islands. We're back from this, this trip now, and we're on this old set of islands off the coast of South America that were probably connected to South America in the past. Um, there are birds like, uh, actually I didn't, I put the, the logo on here. You notice the logo is a sheep, um, or the emblem of the Falklands is crowned by a sheep. There are many, many sheep on the island. The environmental destruction across many of the main islands is pretty substantial. They've pushed a lot of the native wildlife out of the edges. One of the species like that, because they considered it a threat, is this endemic caracara called the uh, striated caracara. But you're starting to run into a whole different diversity of things like torrent ducks, which are these really cool, often flightless birds from, uh, that are found on South America and the Falklands. And then this is an endemic radiation of geese called, uh, uh, that, that in this particular one is called kelp goose. 
And then you run into species with, that are part of genera that you recognize from other parts of the world. This is an austral thrush, which is in the same genus as our American robin. And they've gotten all the way out here to the Falklands and, and have an endemic species. Then there are things that have come from South America but don't have any close relatives, like this white bridled finch, which is found in a limited part of uh, the uh, eastern part of Argentina, but makes it out to the Falklands. And then this is red breasted metal or long tailed metal lark, which is a species from the southern part of South America. And then you see something like this. And this is a Falkland Islands black crowned night heron which is considered to be a different species now based on morphology, although I don't think anybody's done any genetic work. This is a bird you can see in the Lincoln Park Zoo. They, there's a nesting colony there and they're, they're basically on every continent. Now, one of the neat things about the Falklands is we got to, out to a place called Sea Lion Island, which is a spectacular nature preserve. And I'm gonna finish up with some penguins, but I wanted to include this story about fur seals. We're walking along the beach, uh, at, at this island and this fur seal looks like it's a little injured up on shore. We pass it by the one on the right in the smaller picture comes up out of the water and looks like it wants to come up on shore with us as we're eating lunch. And it goes back down into the cove that we were in and joins this other animal. And right after that happened, Jane says, killer whales. And it was very clear that these, this pod of four killer whales was actually cruising around, keeping track of these fur seals, just waiting for them to come back into the water. All right, Jintu penguins again. These are Falkland Jintu penguins. Now they're in this tussock grass on this flat land. And as I said before, the chicks get bigger and bigger over the course of the season. Now you've got this keystone cop thing where these adult penguins are literally running away from their chicks because they're haranguing them so much. And so this is the time in which they begin to get back in the water or begin to the time in which they begin to cut ties and get them into the water. There are several other species of penguins here that we haven't encountered before. Here's a new genus, Magellanic penguin, which is a, a genus of penguin that's found in Southern South America, gets up to the Galapagos, but it's also in Africa and uh, they nest in burrows. And then the last species of penguin I wanna mention is rockhopper penguin. So this is another, this is in the uh, genus Eudiptes, but these guys are, are called rockhopper penguins because they literally hop rocks and they have this incredible plumage with this punk hairdo. That's a juvenile down in the lower right. And this is where their colonies are, the kinds of places. That's a 200 foot cliff over the, uh, Arctic Ocean looking, Antarctic Ocean looking south. And there's a little ravine in between there that these guys are coming up time and time again to feed their chicks on top of this, uh, this cliff face. And so I'm gonna stop there. This is a Magellanic penguin looking into the water. Um, like I said, it was an amazing trip. I like to think that what I saw was that penguins do amazing things. Maybe humans can do some amazing things too. Um, the people on the left are, are all instrumental in letting this uh, trip happen. Um, I mentioned a bunch of them before. Um, Sally Ponsett is the uh, is Leaf's mother and she's one of the leading uh, conservation people in the Falkland Islands. We're lucky, lucky to meet her on South Georgia. And then uh, Mickey Reeves and uh, uh, Sarah uh, Crofts on uh, Sea Lion Island are just incredible people keeping track of penguins and also creating great habitat on the Falkland Islands. And I'll stop there. Thanks very much. And I'm happy to take questions. And just so folks know, I'm gonna be watching Emily back there in case there are questions from uh, the online crew. Yeah, Kevin. You had photos of the Southern Shag and had these orange growths on its face. Yeah, those are a uh, good question. They're, I don't know what their purpose is. I mean, they're, they're, they're part of the, uh, around the nares. And I would say that the coloration is almost certainly that he was asking what the colors were on these uh, Arctic Antarctic shags. And 
I'd say they're for display. You know, and if you think about double crested cormorants, they often have the breeding plumage, uh, throat coloration gets much more intense and things. Emily's got a question from the back. Question from Akila Wilkes. Uh, thanks for the talk. I love penguins. Me too. Have you had any particularly intrepid penguins approach you while doing scientific work? I mean, almost every penguin you see is in, is like that. And, and that's a truly phenomenal thing. I mean, one thing we were always trying to do when we were uh, basically grabbing adults to bleed them is you have to watch to make sure that, that no skua or, or well, actually, skuas are about the only things that would do it. But you want the you don't want the skuas to come down and bother bother the chicks. And and you know, again, the chicks as they get older are just really kind of fun to watch and and are just fascinated by you. Yeah, no, there's they're all amazing. Yeah, Philip. Yeah, that was a great talk and fantastic pictures. Um, Question, what is known about, yeah. what is known about uh, any like diseases, avian flu or other pathogens down there? Say, say, say that again, sorry. What is known about uh, diseases uh, or any other like avian flu or any other pathogens in, in these regions that you visited? So there, there's, there's definitely been some work on that. I, I would not call myself an expert on what's going on. I will give an example of, of something that we saw, which we were taking notes on, which was really fascinating to me, which is when we got to South Georgia, we got to a chinstrap colony and there were a lot of dead chinstraps, penguins along in the colony and they'd been dead for a long time. And the more we looked at it, we actually think it wasn't disease related. We think that one of the things that, that can happen in these situations, and there's some evidence for this is, these birds will come ashore to breed. If they get an early heavy snowfall, they may get trapped in situations where they can't get out into the water. And we think that's what happened here rather than disease. You know, I think one of the reasons why penguins have done so well is for the most part, there aren't a lot of diseases out in this part of the world because of the temperatures and things. And so you really wonder what's gonna happen over time. Yep. We have a question from Matt Nelson. Uh, wonderful talk, John. Were you and the team looking at lice or other parasites? Yeah, we didn't find very many. So coming back to, to Philip's question earlier, I mean, we, we found a few and we absolutely, we, we saved them. I oh, Full disclosure, the one tick we had, I dropped into a bunch of putrid penguin poop and we couldn't find it again. Um, so I failed my duties there, but uh, we did find a few, uh, a few parasites, which we, we duly put into alcohol and, and saved. It's amazing how low the diversity is. I mean, again, if you think about it, then there are probably only about 20 species, 25 species of birds on the Antarctic Peninsula total. Um, you get to South Georgia and it jumps to about 30 or 35 maybe. And by the time you get to the Falklands, it's into the 60s and that's about it. And so insects are very few and far between. There's one species of earthworm on uh, South Georgia, I think. Um, it's just a, you know, it's an incredibly uh, un, un, non-diverse uh, living fauna. That's not as true for things like lichens and, and some of the, the uh, basal plant type things. Mm -hmm. so, um, you mentioned that the penguins have very close head on. So do the wings or the cheeks have a reaction when um, we, we grab one of them to eat a sample? Just, just ask it, just say it again, sorry. Um, you mentioned that the penguins have very close pair bonds. So do the mates or their chicks respond when one is grabbed with or something? Yeah, no, good, good question. So yeah, so so yeah, these pair bonds are very strong. So we would we would target situations where there were two birds at the nest. So one of the things that's going on this time of year with with young is 
you frequently got one of the adults out foraging. And so there might only be one uh, adult at the nest. But when there are two adults net, at the nest, they immediately take care of the chicks and, and yeah, and take over. And then the adults go right back to caring for them afterwards. And this is, this is one of the things about birds is that this time in the nesting cycle, they've invested enough in their young that they're not gonna be deterred by, by, a little, by someone taking a little bit of blood and then letting them go. Is, uh, any, is, uh, is there any predation at night on these colonies? So that's a really interesting question. So Kevin uh, Swagel is asking, is there any predation at night on these colonies? So with the penguin colonies, no, there, there are short-eared owls actually on South Georgia, I mean, uh, on the Falklands. So there could be, I guess, on, on the Falklands. But in the other places, not really, with the one caveat, so this is an interesting thing. So when you go to the, the Procellariform colonies, so like we were able to get up into the hills to where the Antarctic prions are breeding in these holes. And they're likely doing that because of some history of predation, although you think there wouldn't be that much. But when you start walking around, you'll find pieces of prions. And so it's very clear that what must be skuas are actually hanging around those colonies and probably picking individuals off as they come out of their nest holes. So there's definitely some predation. Again, the weird thing about those situations is again, in the height of the austral summer, there's not that much darkness at, 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 the, at the highest, you know, at the, at the highest latitudes. Yeah. Ooh, funny question. So the quick answer is yeah, and, and and it was jarring because of how remote these areas were and how little there was. Now, the one thing that we did see is we were pulling into one of the really remote harbors and there was this giant dock buoy. I may not be getting that name right, which our captain would just laugh at me, but it was this giant solid plastic ball that was I don't know, I wouldn't be surprised if these things are hundreds of dollars a piece that had come off some big boat. And it had washed up along one of the beaches out on these peninsulas. And you start realizing that this stuff could come from thousands of miles away. And that we picked up, tied to the back of the boat and brought back to Stanley. But yeah, no, it, but very little to be honest. But when you see it, it's like, just reminds you that, that a lot of this has to be coming from a very long ways away. Because one of the things that's been very impressive is the tour operators that work in this part of the world have worked together to be very conscious. They work with the governments to be very conscious of, of doing everything they can to have the minimum impact in these areas. And so, yeah, there's, there's very little evidence of, of any kind of garbage like that at all. All right, well, thanks very much for coming. I really appreciate it.